Thanks everyone for choosing to come and learn about mental health um, instead of spending this hour going and playing some really, really awesome games. This is super important though, um, and I really appreciate you all giving your time to be here. My name's Jen, Dr. Jennifer Hazel, as um, Tabby and Chris insist on calling me consistently, but Jen is fine. Uh, and I run a non-profit organisation called Checkpoint Org. I'm a medical doctor, I specialise in psychiatry, and I've come here all the way from Australia to be with you today. Though this accent is actually English, I'm not Australian. I'm just one of those people that travels around the world. I went on a year out that never ended. Um, so, what we're going to talk about today is mental health for the game dev community. Um, and the reason that I'm here is I run Checkpoint. We're a non-profit and we act to connect mental health care with video games and technology. Our two main activities are providing game therapy, which is something that we do in mental health facilities, but also at conventions, for events for underprivileged communities. Um, we provide wellbeing workshops like this one in the games and tech industries themselves. We also contribute to research, game development, and we try to improve representation of mental illness in the games industry. The talk's going to go in three phases because I love the rule of threes. First, we're going to talk about why mental health is important and why we should all be making a conscious effort to look after it and share with our colleagues how to do these things. We're going to go through some mental health 101. And what do I mean by that is this isn't treatment, this isn't therapy, it's not something that you're going to be able to take away and be like, you know what, I never need to think about this ever again because I've been taught now what mental health is. <laughs> This is like a starter course to really understand what is mental health, why should I be looking at it, and what tools are out there for me to continue to go on my mental health journey. So I'll introduce you some, some basic concepts that you can go away and look up for yourself if you find them interesting, if you find them relevant to you. There's heaps of different directions you can go in when it comes to therapy and mental health. And it's really important to know that everyone's an individual. It's a very personal journey. And these are just some of the different ways you can start exploring your journey. And then we'll do some questions at the end. I'll leave like 10, 15 minutes, depending on how enthusiastically I talk, for questions. So this talk could be pretty dry. It's about mental health. It's a really, really deep um, and you know quite intrusive topic to some people and I'm giving it to the game dev community so I try to make it as relevant to games as I possibly can but me mental health is for everybody right and the way I've started this shall I turn down the light so you can see it or is it not too bad well, it's good, you're all right sweet um, mental health is like magic points in Final Fantasy <laughs> Bear with me, this is going somewhere. So, we're all gamers, we make games, that's kind of what we do. I've played games since I was five, I don't make them myself personally yet, um, but big, big, big fan, talk of game communities all over the world. And uh, the reason that I'm using this analogy is it's because something that helped me when I was kind of growing up and kind of figuring things out. In Final Fantasy, you have different stats, right? You've got your strength, your HP, your vitality, whatever else. But that's all useless if you don't have the reserve to actually give it some power. So if you haven't got MP, you can't use your cure. You can't use your status attacks. You can't do any of those things, which might be good on like a day-to-day -day basis. You might be able to use your physical health, your social circles. You might be able to use those individual tools that you have on a day-to-day -day basis and you'll probably be fine most of the time. But when the boss battle comes, when the ultimate weapon appears, what are you going to do if you don't have a really good reserve behind you? You need to keep that MP filled up. You need to keep your reserve filled up so that you can use those tools in your toolbox at times of stress, at times of crisis. That's my really spurious analogy and it's not the only one. So bear with me, we're going to go on a fun ride. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to do a poll. I'm not going to ask anyone to speak up, don't feel pressured. 
but we're going to do a around the room, just raise your hands poll. Who in the room has had a physical health issue in their life? That's better than I usually get, actually. I'd say, what, that's like 70, 80%. Who in the room has ever had a cold? <laughs> the people that rose their hand the second time and not the first time, why? Is a cold not a physical health issue? <laughs> it's caused by rhinovirus, most of the time. It's a viral infection. It's contagious. It's something that comes into your body, your body has to fight. But the vast majority of us don't think of it as a physical health issue because it only lasts a couple of days and it's a minor inconvenience at best. You might pull a sickie and get off work, that's cool. But really, it's, it's not too big a deal. But what if you were having chemotherapy or you had a genetic immunodeficiency that meant your body couldn't fight infection? A cold could suddenly become something that's deadly. That's a physical health issue, right? Okay, who's had a mental health issue? That's much better than I usually get. Yes. <laughs> That's why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's ever been stressed? Everyone. It's the same thing, right? You see where I'm going? Stress, no matter how you want to see it, it's a mental health issue. I'm preaching to the converted. You, go, you guys know. But it's, it's a really important way that you can use to reframe your thinking about mental health and physical health. And it's also when you see your friends and your peers that are like not in the room and they're like, yeah, I didn't go to that talk because, you know, I don't need to worry about mental health. This is what they do. Stress is a physiological response to a real or perceived threat, right? Or anxiety is that. It's the body's way of dealing with the huge rush of cortisol that's just been released from your adrenals. Not your brain, your adrenals, a gland just above your kidneys. Normal day to day is fine. No one worries about feeling stressed one day, two days, three days. But if that's persistent and it goes over a long period of time, this is a real physiological change and your body's gonna be responding to that in a certain way. That's a mental health issue. That's how people get into kind of spirals where they don't look after it, they don't keep check on it they end up with clinical depression, clinical anxiety. Sometimes they might have a psychotic breakdown. But we can intervene at those lower levels to help ourselves stabilize and make sure that we're not getting lost in what could be a lot more dangerous. Um, again, I'm preaching to the converted. You guys, you guys know about this, but there, there are a few vulnerabilities that are specific to being a game dev. Um, a lot of people will have multiple jobs, whether it's because they're working full-time outside of dev or part-time and then they're doing dev on the side, or whether it's just they're doing multiple jobs in the game dev sphere. There's a crunch culture in game dev that doesn't exist in other fields. I told um, when I was doing my wellbeing workshop prep and I was kind of speaking to the mental health industries in Australia, I was like, yeah, they, um, they have this really, really negative crunch culture. And this moment went, I haven't heard that word in 20 years <laughs> because everyone else has gotten rid of it. But, you know, if you're an indie dev, you're not unionized. You've got no one representing you. There's nothing to stop you from working 120 hour weeks. I didn't think there's that many hours in a week. 164, is that right? There we go, quick maths. There's a lot of financial pressure to do well. You know, you need to stay afloat. There's a lot of competition, very oversaturated market. And it can be really isolating. So, as I say, I'm preaching to the converted. You guys know why you're here, right? But it's important for game devs specifically to really think about these issues. So let's talk about how to look at your mental health and what to do if things aren't quite right. I've developed a three-step model that's based on a variety of psychological theories. Again, it's the rule of threes, right? Something that we can all understand in the room. And that model is technically not in three because it's a cycle, so it goes round and round and round. Number one is inspect, number two is accept, and number three is act. And we're going to go through each of those and talk about how to do them. Um, so number one, inspect. You're at the beginning of your mental health journey and it kind of feels like a stage from Zork. If ever anybody remembers this very classic text adventure. So you're in this maze, right? That has a map, but you can't see it. 
all you know is what you've just been told. You're in a maze of twisty passages all alike. This is what it can feel like when you've got no idea what's out there for mental health. If you don't even understand what mental health is, how to look inside, how to learn these things. Every direction just looks as bewildering as the last. There's all of these different resources that you can use, but you don't know what's right for you. And this is what I'm going to try today to help you to start navigating. One of the most important concepts in psychology and psychiatry is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Has anybody seen this before? Good. So you guys, I don't, why are you here? <laughs> Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for anyone that doesn't know, is a model for existing. You start at the bottom and then you work your way up. Right at the top is self-actualization. This is flourishing, fulfillment. This is being the best, most fulfilled person you could be. But to get there, you have to start right at the bottom. I've actually seen this done um, where there's another layer below this one, which is just Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> but after Wi-Fi, you need to eat. <laughs> you need to sleep. And you need to drink. And there's others in there as well, you know, uh, having sex and stuff like that is in there too. Apparently that's super important to Maslow, but for the rest of us, eat, sleep, drink. If any one of those is missing, you're not surviving. So if you're in that state where you're like, I don't really know, there's something not quite right in my life right now. I feel like I'm doing all the right things, but that, that's just, I just don't feel right. Go to the pyramid, go to the bottom and work your way up. Am I eating well? Am I sleeping enough? Sleeping is like my favorite thing to do. <laughs> and I'm really, really glad that I dedicate that time to sleeping. Are you drinking enough water? You have no idea how much better it feels if you just force yourself to drink two liters of water a day. It's just incredible, like to just, right, chugging it. Just go to the bottom of the pyramid, work up, start ticking the boxes. When you get to the next level, safety, security, it's, it's not just about having a roof over your head, it's about having the financial sa like safety to exist in the world. It's about having the security of your neighbourhood, your community, things like that. As you can see, these get harder as you go up. Love and belonging. Are you in a social circle that supports you, whether that be friends, family, your partner? Do you have people around you that help you feel part of society? You, you are a social creature. We wouldn't have evolved if we weren't social. It's really important. Esteem is not just about self-esteem. It's just about having the tools to believe in yourself, but also be comfortable with yourself. So it's getting up on a stage. It's saying to your friend, hey, did this thing, do you want to see it? It's saying, hey, I need help. Can you help me, please? And that's the only way that you can get right to the top. I have never in my entire career met anyone that is consistently up there. Everyone falls down and gets back up again. It's kind of what we do. That's fine. That's normal. The next step, once you've thought about your pyramid, once you've thought about these are the things I need to be safe, these are the things I need to be loved, blah, blah, blah. You can start delving into what is essentially one of the key concepts of any psychological therapy, understanding the difference between thoughts and feelings. Now, some people find this really easy to do and they're looking at me like, what do you want about love? <laughs> Other people really, really struggle with this. They don't understand that there is a difference between thoughts and feelings. So, for example, a thought is a word or a concept. It's a stream of information in your mind that you can interpret and communicate to another person. It's the way that you're perceiving the world. It's the way that you plan things. You know, I could think, oh, I'm gonna walk into the center of the room and then I'm gonna walk back over here. That's me thinking. But if I got to the middle of the room and I'm like, there's this really bright light in my eye right now and I feel really anxious about that. That's a feeling. You can put words to feelings, but often it's much harder. And often it's, 
they're not as clear, they're very instinctual, they're deep inside of you. So there's a part of the brain that is the amygdala, it's right in the middle, like middle middle, we call it the lizard brain, because it's what we've had since we were lizards. It's the part of the brain that tells us if there's a big scary monster, you run away from it. Monster. <laughs> I'm still in game mode. <laughs> when we were when we were cavemen and we were running away from, you know, I don't know, mammoths and saber toothed tigers and stuff, it was the thing that was like, that's gonna kill me, I'm off. So in this society that we live in, we're not being chased by saber toothed tigers, but there's still things that are really scary. We still feel love, we feel anger, we feel anxiety. And they're, they're right, they're deep in here. And the relationship between these two concepts, thoughts and feelings, they're so intertwined, they loop around. And if we're able to separate them, you can get in the middle. And that's one of the really key steps in understanding what's going on for you at any one moment, and then being able to take steps to intervene if necessary. And you might not need to, you might just be like, oh, hey, I'm thinking positive thoughts and I feel pretty good right now, go me. Or you might be like, oh, oh I feel really worried. I, everyone, no one's gonna turn up to my talk. Everyone's gonna think it's rubbish. And then I'm like, well, no, because there's gonna be some people there and I've done this talk loads of times, so it'll be fine. Feeling really anxious, being like, oh, it's not, not quite right. But once you recognize that, you can take steps to intervene. And we're gonna talk more about that later, but first of all, identifying thoughts and feelings. One of the key things that Tabby and Chris were talking about a lot during their talk is having different roles. Now, I've taken this, it's a, a messy diagrammatic representation of what any person might be at any one time. And I use a concept called Super's Life Space Theory um, to talk about this. Now, I'll have like lecture notes available on my Twitter afterwards. Um, so if you want to go and like read up all, on all these things, they'll be there for you. And Super's Life Space Theory talks about the different roles that we have in life and the theatres in which those roles are being played out, as though it is literally like a performance, right? So when I'm at home, I'm Jen. You know, I'm silly. I like food, I like sleeping, I play games. When I'm at work, I'm Dr. Jen. I'm the same person, but I'm not the same person. I'm putting on a performance, really. So people wouldn't expect the same behavior from me at home and at work. They're two different theaters. The interesting thing about uh, these days, as <laughs> though so, I'm so old, life these days, um, <laughs> is, you know, you, you can be at work and at home at the same time. You could be out in a cafe with your laptop, having a meeting. You're in a social situation, but you're also, you've got your work hat on as well. Identifying the different roles in your life is really important, and identifying the theatres within which you're playing them is really important too. Because you need to have boundaries, but you also need to have flexibility. So you need to be able to move from one theatre to another, and start playing one role and then another role, but learning to keep them separate in your mind whilst being able to do that fluid transition between the two. It's really hard sometimes, it's really hard. And the different roles that you have in your life, you can think about in terms of the values that you put to them. And that's gonna be a very personal and cultural and individual thing, um, it will be very dependent on the way that you were raised or where you were raised. Some people put a lot of value in um, their, their extended family. Some people don't, that's fine. It's your, it's your journey, it's your role, they're your theatres. And another important thing to consider is the way that you communicate those theatres to the people that are around you. It's really, really important to be able to tell people hey, this is what I'm doing right now, this is where I am right now. I'm, I'm Dr. Jen, I'm at work. Or I'm at home, I'm not gonna be able to give you medical advice, I don't want to. I'm not Dr. Jen right now, I'm, I'm just Jen, I'm just me. And to be able to communicate that to other people is a really important step in understanding them for yourself, but also kind of functioning socially. Um, and I think that's something that gets missed a lot in game dev, because, you know, when, when are you ever not a game dev? 
exactly. <laughs> so you're going to have a lot of different things going on all at once. And we'll talk about how to assess what's important to you and then weight it. That's one of the things we'll talk about later. At the moment, we're still inspecting. This is another psychological model. It's called the well-being model. It's pretty similar to Maslow, but um, it really takes the concept of having domains and makes that clear, brings clarity to it so that you can think about the different domains that are in your life and how you could fulfill each one. So physical health is, is obvious, you know. You need exercise, you do. Um, it's not fun, but afterwards it feels pretty good. You need to look after your physical health by going to the doctor regularly, making sure that you're not ignoring like worrying symptoms. You need to look after your psychological health, and whether that means, you know what, I'm so burned out right now that I just fell asleep on the floor. I should probably take a break from work for two weeks. It's fine. You're looking after your psychological health. Your social health. And that's not just uh, who's around you, as in your friends and your family. It means where are you in your community? So, for example, for me, it's really important to give back to the game dev community because you know, I love you guys. I'm not one of you, but I love you. And I like to help, and that makes me feel good. You know, this isn't truly altruistic. I like doing it. It makes me happy. And so that's what it means by social and community, is being part of something wider is really important. Um, security again and environment, which is, I don't know about that one. <laughs> For me personally, I don't, not as into the environment stuff, but you know, it's the world we live in, it's the world we're going to be leaving to our kids. So being part of an environment and getting out and in involving yourself in social issues like that is part of the well-being model. What about when things are not quite right to the point of it being a diagnosable mental illness? I really like this diagram thing, comic, um, because it communicates what a person with depression often can't communicate, and that's that they're not just sad all the time, which is how the media has kind of portrayed it for many years. They feel a lot of different negative emotions, and a lot of the time they just feel nothing, which is completely apathetic. And that's one of the key symptoms that we look for when we're assessing someone for clinical depression. That they're persistently low, or they just don't feel anything at all. When they just don't care, that's when we start worrying as doctors. It's, it's not the people that are really, really sad, because they still care. They care enough to be sad. It's people that just don't anymore. Are you having problems with sleeping? Too much? Too little? One of the key sleeping problems with clinical depression is people wake up really early in the morning. It's called early insomnia. They wake up at like four, five, three, two can't get back to sleep again, that's it, every night. Just being persistently tired all the time, eating too much, not eating enough. My worst patients, uh, not the worst patients, the people that I know that have got like the worst depression, they lose 10, 20, 30 kilos. It's just not eating. Is your concentration really poor? Is it hard to read more than a page of a book or watch a TV show? because you just can't concentrate on just for like 22 <coughs> minutes for an episode of The Big Bang Theory, if that's what you're into. <laughs> As I said, apathy. And sometimes, particularly, sorry, in dudes, depression doesn't come out as feeling sad or crying, or even not eating or not sleeping. It comes out just being really annoyed and angry all the time. If you experience these symptoms, you could be experiencing depression it's really important to go and see someone about it because there is treatment. So one of the really important aspects of this talk when we're talking about inspecting is just being aware of like, you know, it's not right, but it's really not right at the moment. I should go and talk to someone about it. The other one I wanted to talk about, the other most common mental health problem in 
young people, so between the ages of 15 and 30, I think a quarter of us will have one of these two at any one time, so it's like 25% of the people in this room, let's be fair, probably more, because we're here. <laughs> anxiety is a spectrum, it's not just one thing. Anxiety can be generalised anxiety disorder, just feeling really worried about everything all the time. It can be panic disorder, where certain situations, and it's not just social situations, but that is a really common one, um, can actually induce a panic attack, which can is, it is real physical symptoms. They're not in your head, they're real. It's a real thing that's happening. Your heart's beating really fast. You're breathing really quickly. Your mouth starts tingling. You start feeling faint, dizzy, overwhelmed. I can't do this. And that is actually a physiological response to the huge rush of cortisol that's just come out of your adrenals telling you, you need to run right now. There is a saber-toothed tiger about to kill you. That's what's happening, except there's no tiger. It's just like a whole bunch of people. And that's a bit much. And that's, they're real symptoms. It's a real thing that's protected us for many years. Sometimes it's not relevant anymore. And that's when it becomes a problem when it's interfering with your function. Um, OCD, obsessions and compulsions, that's a type of anxiety disorder, as is PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is technically an anxiety disorder. Um, so if you're having flashbacks or nightmares because of a traumatic experience, it's probably an anxiety disorder that is treatable. Um, and other symptoms, people can get really avoidant of what's triggering their anxiety. So they might stop going to school, they might stop going to work or avoid that place that makes them anxious. That actually makes it worse because you get into a negative feedback cycle. Um, it's really exhausting to be anxious, like all the time. If you think about the physiological process that's going on there, this is like a real thing happening in your body that's prepping you to run. So, as I say, there's the big saber-toothed tiger, there's the big rush of adrenaline, of cortisol, of all the other corticosteroids, and your body actually stops doing stuff and starts doing other stuff. Your muscles get tense because it's like, okay, I'm gonna run now. Your gut just stops digesting. It's just like, that's not important, don't need to. So it just stops. It's exhausting to be in that state all the time. People get really tired. They might have low self-esteem, they might just feel like, this is terrible. And actually, having suicidal thoughts and suicidality is not something that is unique to depression. People with anxiety can feel very suicidal um, and might even attempt suicide because they're just exhausted and they just can't do it anymore. Because it's so persistent all the time. Obviously, if you've experienced that, it's time to get help like now. Um, and we'll give the local phone lines at the end of the talk. Let's move on to something a little bit nicer. Um, am I on time? I am! <laughs> Amazing. So, we're going to try and accept what's going on for us right now. Um, I've put in some quotes from video games because I'm a super nerd. Uh, this is from Pokemon. Black and white. Yep, that's the one. <laughs> it's more important to master the cards you're holding than complain about the ones your opponent was dealt. I think that's a really important analogy for mental health care. It's more important to accept what's going on for you right now than to worry or wish that things were different. So, we're going to do a mindfulness meditation exercise which I think is a really powerful way of checking in with yourself, finding out what's going on for you right now and accepting it as part of you at this time. So mindfulness has three pillars. It's an ancient Buddhist practice that has kind of resurged recently in the media and I think it's a really good thing because I love it and I do it like all the time. The three pillars of mindfulness is that it is on purpose. So you're doing it on purpose, you're doing it consciously you're aware that you're doing it it's now it's in this moment it's not 10 minutes ago or 10 minutes in the future it's now it's here and it's non-judgmental so whatever you're experiencing during your mindfulness exercise it's cool it's fine it's not a problem so without further ado All of 
those things that we just found out when we were inspecting ourselves is just accepting that that's going on for me right now. And that's what's happening and that's fine. It's a really good way of practicing to learn how to forgive yourself for things that you punish yourself for and to just say to yourself, you know what, you're doing good, this is okay. Non-judgmental. And that means being non-judgmental about you and what you're experiencing at the time that you're practicing your mindfulness. So you might do it for five minutes at the end of the day. You might do it when you first wake up in the morning. You might do it 10 times, once an hour over the course of the day because that's what you need to do or you want to do. And that's fine. Five minutes, there's three minute ones. Just Google mindfulness meditation and you'll get like a gazillion different options and they're all, well, the vast majority are free. So, moving back to our three step model, we're at the last stage, which is act. You've looked in, you've thought about what's going on for you right now, what are you experiencing? You've accepted it, and it's going on for you. Well, what do you do? How do you move on from this point? I think this is Max Payne, but I've been told that it might not be. I googled Max Payne and this was the picture that came up. I haven't played the later ones, but this is a Max Payne quote. The genius of the whole, no matter how long you spend climbing out, you can still fall back down in an instant. This is why the three-step model is a cycle, because everything that we do in mental health is always two step forward, one step back. And that's just the reality of it. As I say, no one ever spends all of their time at the top of the pyramid. It's just not feasible, it's just not doable. So don't ever expect yourself to be 100% fine, 100% of the time. It's literally not a thing that I've seen anyway. And as with Tabby talked, if you find anyone that's like that, can you send them my way? Because I'd really like to know how it's done. And just to contrast with that quote, his vice from Skies of Arcadia, and he says, even if you run into a storm, there's always a way out, no matter how bleak things seem. So, if you're down in that hole and you feel like I can't climb out of this again, it will happen. There can't be a storm that is over the entire world. Eventually, you'll get out of it. Here's how. <laughs> Here's how 101. So, we talked about Super's life space model earlier. The different roles and responsibilities that you have. I think one of the really important things to do is to create a life role portfolio. Think about the different roles that you're playing in the different theatres that you're playing them in and really assess each one. How important is it to you? How much time are you spending playing that role in that theatre? How do you feel about it? If you consider those three things we call this, life role salience, it's understanding all of the different contributions to what you're doing at any one time and who you're being at any one time. So for example, in this model, this person considers their role as a father and a husband to be very important. They spend more time doing it than anything else. Gives them pleasure, it's all the way over there. They see being a game dev as more valuable and important to them as being an accountant, which is their full-time job. So it's in front of that. But they spend more time being an accountant because it's 40 hours a week if you work full-time. So if you plan it out like this, and this is a very arbitrary way of doing it. I've done it purposefully like this because obviously it's going to be very individual to you. But you think about how important each role is to you, how much time you're spending doing it, and how you feel about it. You get to kind of map out visually in a way that's much easier and less confusing to understand each of those roles and how they fit into your life. And it also gives you the opportunity to think about maybe the ones you're not paying as much attention to as you should be and kind of reevaluate that. For example, if you're an accountant, if you've got to spend 25% of your time, a quarter of your time in an office crunching numbers, and you hate it, try and find something about it to love. Because you've got to spend that much time doing it. If you're spending 
30% of your time game dev or soccer team, but that's not letting you do the accountant and the father husband thing, or wife, daughter, mother, whatever. Think about how much time you're spending doing each thing and if that's the most fulfilling way you could be living your life. And it's an ongoing process and it changes all the time. And again, that's fine. Walking the middle path is a technique that we use in DBT, Dialectical Behavioural Therapy. And it describes that each decision that we make at every point is a combination of the input from your logical mind and your emotional mind. So some decisions that you make are actually all about emotion and nothing about logic, but you need both. Logic regulates your actions and emotion gives you values and puts your experiences forward and allows you to balance the two. Once you get right in the middle of that, walking the middle path, this is called the wise mind. And it's really hard to get used to this concept at first. You need to kind of think about the way that you're thinking. Is this like all or nothing thinking? Am I thinking, you know, oh God, um, it's, it's either gonna be terrible or it's not gonna happen. Is there a gray area in the middle that you could consider? Where could your logic come in and challenge those emotions? Looking for similarities between the two is really helpful and accepting change is really powerful. Accepting change in the way you think and make your decisions. And one of the most well-known and most powerful tools in psychology is cognitive challenging, which is the core key concept of CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. So the idea behind this, you remember earlier we talked about thoughts and feelings. Thoughts and feelings lead to behavior and often a stimulus, a situation, event, a trigger, leads to the thought, which leads to the feeling, sorry, which leads to the behavior. CBT allows us to kind of get in that process and stop it before the negative behaviors that have a negative impact on our life are allowed to happen. So I've got an example here, um, which is just from Google. But in this person, their physical feelings at any time and the experiences that they're having causing them to feel tired and drained they've got no concentration and their sleep's disturbed they're thinking i'm worthless i'm a failure no one likes me and that's causing them to feel or it's interacting with the way that they feel they're feeling depressed isolated and alone but what you can do is you can challenge the thoughts if you get one of those automatic negative thoughts in your mind and it's telling you something, this a very powerful value statement. If I get the thought and I say to myself enough, I'm worthless, I'm gonna believe it. But if I'm like, I'm worthless, mm, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm not a mother, but I'm a great girlfriend. Um, I work and that's good, you know, I'm contributing to taxes and stuff even if like I don't like doing it some days you challenge those thoughts you challenge the feeling and eventually if you do this enough you stop feeling that way at all it's really powerful this is a super super basic way of modeling that but it's it's step one which is what we're here to talk about today and when to seek help this is the most important part of my talk. If you take one thing away from it, please take this slide away. Sometimes, even with all of the tools in our toolbox, you can't keep going without help. If you do, you just get worse. Things aren't gonna get better. They might eventually, but what will you have lost in that process? Sometimes it's really important to reach out and talk to someone, whether it's a friend that can refer you on or whether it's going to your family doctor or seeing a psychologist, whatever. If you're feeling that life isn't worth living, please go and see someone. If you're having physical symptoms that you can't control, and that includes not being able to sleep, go and see someone. If you're not functioning, you're missing school, you're not going to work, 
please go and see someone. You, you need to be fulfilling those roles in those theatres to maintain your well-being. And if you're not doing that, you're going to get worse. If you've tried self-help and it hasn't worked, go and see someone. You probably need someone else to help you, whether that's with medication or therapy or whatever. If you've tried by yourself and it isn't working, logic dictates. Next thing you do is get someone else to help you. And the last point is if you want to. If you feel like, I'm struggling, I've been struggling for a long time, I don't really fit any of these criteria, but this has been going on long enough. If you want to, go and see someone. So, we did the three-step model, and now this is what your Zork maze should look like. I told you that was going somewhere. <laughs> now we're in the exact same maze. You're in a maze of twisty passages, all alike. But you've got a map. You can see where you're going. You can see where you'll end up if you go in any direction. Hopefully. And you might still get lost. It's still pretty confusing. It's still going to take ages. It's going to be a lot of effort. But you've got a much better idea of where to go and how to get there. There's some really good apps out there. Again, I'll post a list on my Twitter, which is rx underscore pixel. Um, so super better. Uh, Habitica is really good for changing habits. Um, what else have I got on my list? Because I can't remember off the top of my head now. Uh, Stop, Breathe and Think is an amazing mindfulness app, and it's free, and I love it. Um, Headspace is a good meditation app, and I work with a company in Australia called Reach Out. They've got a whole bunch of really good iOS apps for mental health. And I'm going to finish with an inspiring quote. This is uh, from Fallout 3, I believe. And Moira. She says, no, it's like, did you ever try to put a broken piece of glass back together? Even if the pieces fit, you can't make it whole again the way it was. But if you're clever, you can still use the pieces to make some other useful things, maybe even something wonderful, like a mosaic. Thank you very much.